Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. After several record-breaking weeks, the stock markets took a breather, but it was a good week for commodities like copper. Gold's rush higher slowed down, but now silver is picking up. Veteran trader Victor Adair comments on whether the AI craze will continue. Is it wise to wait for interest rate cuts, and will the move to gold continue? He also talks about a currency that has taken off the last year or so. Publisher of Kaiser Watch on KaiserResearch.com, John Kaiser, digs deep into the junior mining sector and talks about whether it's about to see a big resurgence. He also has a special offer for our listeners. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from Recyclical Marketing Manager, Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show. Good to be with you, Jim. How would you describe what happened on the markets this week? Well, this is the week of a breather. Last week was the week where we still had a bit of momentum going, but this week was the one that... Uh, it did a bit of a roll, and you got the S&P, uh, the Dow, the NASDAQ, all, you know, closing off on the, the lower part of the week, losing momentum. Some of the big-name stocks definitely taking a breather in here. And not only are the, the, the like the AI stocks that have been just uh, uh, taking this whole thing on the upside, but we've got a rotation going on. And if you take a look, you know, we talked about the the oil market uh, in December, January, that it was basing, and there were some stocks that were starting to show some good buoyancy. Um, some of the big names, the Chesapeake, the uh, Crescent Points, all doing very well. And, you know, here they are making, you know, new monthly highs as um, the uh, – the AI stocks are starting to roll over a bit. So it's rotation that's going on. And, you, you know, you see it over in the base metals as well. Copper had a great breakout this week. And uh, the uh, the copper stocks, you know, there's half a dozen of them that I track. And every one of them has had just a, a nice move. They've all got good-looking bases and uh, uh, breakouts on volume. And uh, who knows, maybe the Chinese economy is going to turn around and uh, there's going to be a, a demand for uh, some of that copper as they uh, start to um, gear out the economy again. What's going on with gold? Uh, gold, we hit our uh, initial upside target in the, uh, the 2170, 2180 range a week ago. Uh, also got uh, two days of really good overbought readings. So guess what? The gold market's taking a breather in here. Closed off the week on the spot price at uh, 2156, you know, down from 2190. So this is the breather we were hoping for. Um, really, uh, at this point, thinking we can get back uh, uh, maybe another $20 from here and have the chance to put in an interim low and uh, be ready for the next run on the upside. So um, I think there's still lots of potential in the gold market. Just a matter of uh, having patience to uh, pick up the uh, dips uh, when they come along. And uh, we're in, I think, the early part of one of those dips right now. And of note, uh, the silver market just had an excellent week, uh, closing pretty much at the best levels of the uh, 
of the week and uh, some of the best prices we've seen in months. So, you know, the rotation is uh, is happening. You've got, uh, say, copper, silver moving. Gold was ahead of itself, taking a bit of a breather. So the, the whole metals complex at this point has uh, some uh, legs within it. What's going on with crude? Uh, crude oil, uh, we're, you know, we got up to the $80 level a week ago. We've held those levels quite nicely. And, uh, the, uh, the stocks that we had recommended in our letter, uh, have done quite nicely here. Uh, we are at this point, middle of March, uh, the Ides of March. And you want to be a little bit leery here because the, the seasonals on the upside probably don't have too much more in the way of legs right now. So, Enjoy this run while it's happening, but, um, you know, clearly it's been a nice move so far, and uh, we'll be looking probably to uh, make in some profits uh, in the next week to 10 days. Anything going on with uranium? Yes, uh, great overbought signals in the uranium here. A couple of weeks ago, the stocks got way ahead of themselves, uh, without a doubt, and uh, we've uh, seen uh, just a, a really good correction uh, they were down, you know, we were up at 105 in uranium prices, now down into the mid-80s. Got the type of oversold signals we'd like to see in a dominant uptrend. And uh, the miners uh, pretty much uh, across the board here uh, look as though they bottomed out a week ago. Basing in this, this week and a bit of a reversal at the end of the week. So I think uh, the uranium stocks probably got the potential to... Uh, move um, quite nicely on the upside. What's going on with the U.S. and Canadian dollars? Uh, Currency-wise, uh, the U.S. dollar has uh, had a, a rough week um, uh, going into uh, the middle of the week, bounced back at the end. Uh, we've been down around 102.5, up to 103.5 at the end of the week. That's put uh, some of the pressure on the, uh, on the uh, uh, precious metal side of things. Um, it's also, you know, we're at the point where we look on every Friday at the commitment of traders' numbers, and uh, the British pound, the Mexican peso, and the treasury bonds are all up into uh, what we would look at as sell levels on the COT numbers. So the probability of a good correction in those um, currencies and uh, the bond market as well. And uh, the other one that has been... Uh, of note was cotton, which broke out of a base here uh, three or four weeks, weeks ago. And now um, COT numbers are up and they're pretty exorbitant. So looking for a decent correction here as a buying opportunity in cotton. Um, and um, that's all in the sell side. On the buy side, Corn and soybeans, um, COT numbers have been really positive here for the last couple of weeks, and uh, corn continues to uh, show a lot of upside uh, potential. So I definitely take a look at uh, being long corn, and both of those uh, items, the corn and soybeans, do have ETFs, uh, CORN for corn and SOYB for the soybeans. So would they be showing up on the AI farming app, AI, AI, AIO? <laughs> well, I guess the farmers would like to have one of those, wouldn't they? And uh, I think that uh, that that's a, a good phrase to be uh, working forward from. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Victor Adair, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Victor Adair, recently retired from nearly 50 years of being in the brokerage business in B.C. His website, victoradair.ca. He's speaking to us 
from Parksville, British Columbia, which is on beautiful Vancouver Island. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Jim, it's always a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you. Before we discuss individual markets, what's your current top-down macro view of the financial markets? <laughs> well, that's uh, <laughs> let's, where do we start? Uh, I'll, make, I'll try to keep it kind of short and sweet. Um, I think we've had uh, just an amazing run in the stock markets, uh, the major in- indices, since October of last year. Um, I, I saw a stat recently. It's been the, the greatest run in terms of momentum in, in 24 years in the S&P. And I'm not the least bit surprised when I see that. Um, I think we are somewhere near uh, some sort of an irrational exuberance phase of, of the rally. Uh, and that would not be surprising given that we've had a great run and some of the run has been fueled by stocks that have just gone absolutely ballistic and of course Nvidia comes to mind but there's other stocks in the in the tech space that have done really really well uh I saw a, a stat just released um yesterday I guess that the capital flows into American investment funds last week and that would be say from around the 7th of uh, March to about the 13th of March, I think, were an all-time record, just short of $60 billion of fresh cash came into the market, into the stock market, that is, with about 40% of that going into technology funds. You know, no surprise. Um, there, I'll, I'll give you this perspective. And by the way, I am definitely not a perma-bear, but I, I am inclined to call BS when I think I see it. But it kind of reminds me of uh, an analyst that used to work for Merrill Lynch years ago was, was famous. His name was Bob Farrell, and he had sort of a list of rules. And one of the things that he observed was that the public buys the most at the top and sells the least. You know, I should say, yeah, you know, the public buys the most at the top of the market. So obviously people are sort of falling over themselves to get into the market here. Pro- professional money managers who run money for other people, you know, have to be buying in this market or have to maintain their long positions just to keep up with the Joneses, as it were. If, not, if they don't, you know, other money managers will manage the money they're managing now. Trend following systems certainly are long or, or very long here. I think we've seen a lot of fear of missing out kind of buying. I think we've seen aggressive buying. Uh, since the Lows that we made in 2009 following the great financial crisis, the S&P has averaged about uh, a 16% per year gain over that terrific period of time. And I think that people just assume, you know, that that will continue like it's a perpetual motion machine. So color me skeptical, okay? That's uh, kind of where I am, and uh, you know that'll that'll show up uh, maybe more as we as we talk about some of the individual markets. The stock industry seemed to make new all time highs every other day, with technology shares leading the way. Do you think this will continue? Uh, You know, the, the technology shares have certainly captured the media attention and they have been leaders especially again like nvidia and, and some of the other ai stocks but i i see a few stocks and like here's one which it's caterpillar tractor okay you don't think of cat as being a high-tech stock but i'm sure with the the equipment that they make it they're using the latest greatest technology but the shares that they're uh the, the shares of, of caterpillar or cat as we call it here um they're up Fifty percent from last October. Uh, Eli Lilly, you know, I think sort of basically uh, on the back of a, a drug that people can take, so they don't they don't get fat or they if they they can eat all they want and not gain weight or whatever it is. And, and don't quote me on that. But uh, I mean, they've had a hell of a run. So you know, the, the healthcare sector has had a, a great run since last October. Uh, there has been certainly some rotation. Uh, when I look at the stock market. I can look at it and think of it as monolithic, you know, the, the, the S&P uh, the 500 index, or I can look at it and see that it's, you know, all these different sectors, and I look at how capital maybe rotate from one sector to another. We've seen some of that. Uh, we've seen certainly 
say that the small cap stocks seem to get left behind as capital rushed into the tech sector, but now it's it's spreading out and 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 you know getting bids as well. Other markets, uh, in you know whether it's in Mexico or Europe or uh, Japan, for instance, you know have had some great runs as well. So there has been a buoyancy in equity markets here since October. Uh, I think it's a little long in the tooth, but it's um, you know everybody or everything has been going up. This week's inflation reports show inflation staying higher for longer. Your thoughts? Yeah, the reports we had this week were the CPI and the PPI, that's the producer price index, and they were both uh, hotter than the market had been expecting. And um, just, I think, you know, we go back over the last couple of years, the market was kind of living and dying on what's the Fed going to do. And I think, Jimmy, on your show here, uh, a number of times I made reference or used this term where I said, you know, the market is waiting for when the Fed finally starts to cut interest rates, and they are going to see that as a green light special to buy virtually everything that's not nailed down. Well, you know, um, my thought has been, and I've been writing in my blog, that I thought inflation was going to be stickier, say, than, you know, people were, were hoping. And, and by the way, I mean, if you, if you do some research, you can find some very, very capable, well-educated and clever people who will give you two different views on, you know, where inflation is going to go. But my thought was that the inflation really came from all of the fiscal stimulus that we had during and following COVID. Okay, that the government running these big deficits, basically printing money and pushing money you know, like right into people's banks, bank accounts was a way hotter way to stimulate the economy than just by trying to have the central banks, you know, manipulate the, the monetary policy. And boy, oh boy, did it ever work? You know, that we kind of goosed everything. But what really happened from that is when you print a lot more money, as it were, you devalue the purchasing power of the money that's already in existence. So oh, I think that has been, or, or that would last longer uh, in terms of, you know, there's people that need to catch up to rising prices. If you haven't got a raise like other people, you know, you want to either go to your union or go to your boss and say, you know, we need to get me paid more. If you're selling stuff, you got to put the prices of it up because your your margins are shrinking or whatever. And speaking of shrinking, you know, if you're selling a product like a box of cereal, you just make it smaller and keep it the same price. We're we're all familiar with this. I just think inflation will be more persistent because the government seemed to be hooked on deficit spending and the public doesn't seem to mind, you know, that, that deficit spending. So uh, I think that is, that, that's my view on it, that the inflation uh, will, will be more persistent. Now, I mean, just a reminder as I'm saying that, because we're doing this kind of ad lib here, there was something that happened last week and it was on the 8th of March. That was the employment report date. And um, the, the employment report was a little softer in the states than had been expected, and that kind of gave the credit markets a bit of a lift. And I think we made what I call a pivot day. On the 8th of March, we had all-time highs in the S&P, in the NASDAQ, in the SOX, which is the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, and in gold. Uh, and there were some other markets that made some important highs, but not all-time highs that day. And I'd say, you know, the, certainly in the currency markets, the, the euro comes to mind, even the Canadian dollar had an important high. And since then, those markets have come lower. And I should also include in there the, the crypto market. Now, on the 8th of March, uh, Bitcoin futures did make a new all-time high, and they traded a bit higher since then, after that, I should say. But uh, at the end of this week, uh, the, the, the crypto market was below where it had been on the 8th of March. What is really this is all about is, um, as I said earlier, you know, the market would live and die on this. What's the central bank going to do? But that seemed to end around mid 
January, when interest rates actually started to go higher, but the stock market kept going higher anyway, it's like they didn't care. They didn't care. Higher interest rates, there was so much momentum driving the stock market that even as interest rates since the beginning of January until Friday of this week, interest rates have gone up. The market has repriced since January when there was an expectation of six or seven even 25 basis points cuts from the Fed before the end of this year. We're now down to three, maybe, and the cut in June which was expected to be the first one. Now that's kind of a 50-50 toss-up as to whether or not that'll happen. So I thought I thought it was just so interesting that the, the stock market that had been just hooked, as it were, on what the Fed's going to do, suddenly beginning in the middle of January, didn't care. And I think that changed on the 8th of March. That's when we had, I'm calling it a pivot. I think now the market is paying attention to what's going on. The stock market is paying attention to what's going on in the interest rate market. And so, the, and the currency markets are paying attention as well. So there, I just, I had to get that in because I think that's just one of the most important things happening here in the short term. For the past couple of years, the markets have lived and died on expectations of what the Fed would do. The Fed's meeting this coming week. What do you think they're going to decide? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, what the market seems to think is that the Fed isn't going to change any, uh, make any change to monetary policies. I mean, that's like a given. I think the expectations were that the, by this week they'd probably be giving us some signal or some guidance or whatever you want to call it that they may be cutting as early as June. Um, the Fed kind of has a history, although they can go back and forth a bit, about saying, well, you know, we're getting closer uh, to the time when we should raise rates, but we don't want to raise them, uh, uh, cut rates, I should say, but we don't want to cut rates too early. So I think right now with the information they have in hand and what everybody else knows is the Fed is not going to change policy uh, you know, next week, and they're probably going to signal something like, well, we're going to be data dependent and we'll kind of keep rates where they are until we see, uh, you know, the whites of their eyes, until we see the information that, you know, we can we can safely start cutting rates without inflation flaring up again. Gold reached all-time highs against all currencies last week. What's driving the rally, and will it continue? Yeah, it's almost like gold was a little bit late to the party. You know, I mean, we had a rally in the at the beginning of October last year, and that had to do absolutely with Hamas attacks into Israel, and the you know the gold had been beaten down. I think we were n- nearly making new lows for the year. I know if the market was sort of despondent and all of a sudden we get this spark that helped rally the gold market so it it took off from the lows ahead of say the equity markets which started their rally at the end of october but lately you know the gold market i've seen uh, gold etfs for instance have just been uh people just been selling them you know uh, as though there was better things to do with your money than put it into etfs I think the the relationship between gold and the dollar and gold and interest rates uh, would have had gold even lower, except for substantial reported buying from central banks, and certainly Russia and, and China are top of the list on that one. So that, that gave gold a lift. But uh, all of a sudden, here in eight days, I guess we rallied the gold market about uh, $170 to new all-time highs. Uh, on the nearby futures market, we traded above $2,200 uh, at the at the highs on the 8th of March. And uh, during that eight-day rally, we saw the open interest of the, the number of contracts that are open on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange expand by 25%. I mean, that that's big. Uh, the open interest shot higher. There was big volume. And on that key day, again, March the 8th, the volume on the gold futures market was over a half a million shares. And we hadn't seen that kind of a number since, say, the panic around the Silicon Valley crisis uh, in, in March of, of last year. So we had this rush of buying in gold. Like I think it, it felt to me as though like gold was trying to catch up with uh, some of the moves in some of the other markets. 
very short term. Uh, I think the move was a little breathless. It's it's kind of drifted sideways to lower thirty forty dollars lower, I guess from the from the highs. Uh, and as you say, yeah, it was higher against all currencies. Uh, where would we go? Uh, I'm in a, and I know you have Ross Clark on. I hope you ask Ross this question because uh, I, I think Ross, because I read his research every week. Um, I think, you know, he and I are, are both of the view that it could set back some from here, but, you know, over the, the months and, and, <laughs> and years to come, uh, we, we'll see higher prices. Probably as much as anything on this view that I have that governments are, uh, okay to devalue the purchasing power of their currencies to grease the wheels of um, society and and so on and you know give everybody what they want and uh, that diminishing the purchasing power of a currency uh, almost is like the, the number one thing that you could look to as a support for gold i saw a comment in your trading desk notes that volatility in the currency markets is at a multi-year low why is that and what are your thoughts on the U.S. and Canadian dollars? Yeah, volatility is low in the in the currency markets. When I say volatility, I mean you know the the implied volatility that we see in the options contracts that are traded. And typically, uh, if, if markets are kind of complacent, you know, there's there's no uh, worry that there's going to be a big shock or you know the latest black swan's going to appear or anything like that. Volatility will will shrink. Uh, volatility is, I think, uh, a classic uh, mean reverting item. Um, anyway, we've seen low volatility like a, across markets, really, and I think there is a, an overall sense of complacency. Yeah, you know, every day there's something that hits the markets, but we get used to that. And I think there is also a lot of volatility selling happening, and we have over the years seen people – uh, believe that they can generate income from selling volatility or enhance income by, by selling vol or selling options against a, a position like a covered right or just naked selling of, of options. And I think that's, that's out there. And I think that's always, it, it's, it's risky because when you buy an option, the most you can lose is what you paid for the option. When you sell an option, you can lose your shirt <laughs> if you're wrong. So uh, if people get complacent and they think like, hey, it's a free lunch by, this, let's say, for instance, in the stock market. If you've been a seller of puts here over the last few months, they all went to zero. You know, so whatever you took in as premium, you kept it and you just, you know, it kind of fueled you to do more and more and more of that. I, I look at some stats that show me that the outstanding uh, puts that are out there where people just, you know, gone sh net short of puts on the stock market to the, for the view that, you know, they think they're going to expire at zero. It's, it's just a scary big number. A scary big in the sense of if the stock market for some reason was to start to go down, then you could really get a domino effect because as it goes down, more and more people need to be sellers, as it were, uh, buying those puts back to cover that would uh, accelerate the, the sell-off. Specifically on currencies, um, coming up early this week, we've got uh, the week ahead, I should say, the Bank of Japan is meeting. There's been some thought that the Bank of Japan, who have kept monetary policy uh, <laughs> easy for 30 years, uh, may be about to change. There's a uh, aggressive moves in Japan to try to get inflation higher, to try to get wages higher. Uh, and, you know, that mind you, you know, people sort of betting against the Bank of Japan. It's been what we call the widowmaker trade for years and years and years. But anyway, on, I think, Monday, the Bank of Japan is going to meet, and if they change monetary policy, that could, depending on how much they change it, that could have kind of a seismic effect across markets. I mean, just as a, in parentheses, as a, for instance, we have a lot of Japanese money in other markets, particularly, let's say, the U.S. Treasury market. And if the Japanese folks 
decided to take some of that money home and put it in their own bond market, then, you know, that's a big seller in the bond market in the United States, and that would cause interest rates to go higher. So whatever the BOJ does, that can have an impact. Uh, the euro, um, I think the way the market's looking at things right now is that the uh, ECB, European Central Bank, is more likely to cut sooner and more this year than the Fed will and all other things being equal, that ought to cause the U.S. dollar to rise against the euro. The uh, Canada, or the Canadian dollar, uh, I like to say that the Canadian dollar goes up or down usually more as a result of things outside of Canada than inside of Canada. So certainly if the euro is weakening, that kind of acts as a drag on the Canadian dollar. And uh, the Cana- Canadian dollar also is highly correlated with the, not only the euro, but also with the American stock market, to say the S&P. So if the S&P is soft and the euro is soft, the Canadian dollar is likely soft as well. Um, so uh, well, one other thing here, the, just one of these, there's just always something interesting going on in markets when you look and say, gee, look at that. The Mexican peso this week traded to a nine-year high. Now, it also hit a historic low, uh, four years ago when COVID hit and the bottom fell out of the Mexican peso and it had been trending lower for, for donkey's years. But uh, the peso, short-term interest rates in Mexico are around 11 and a quarter, 11 and a half percent compared to say around 5% in the United States. And of course around next to nothing in Japan. So there's there's been a, a carry trade out there in the markets where you either borrow Japanese yen and convert it and put the funds into Mexican interest rates and, and make the spread and also make the, 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 the profit on the Mexican peso going up against virtually everything else. You know, or you, you, you can, uh, do a, a U.S. dollar Mexican trade or carry trade and, and get in, Get involved in that 11% yield instead of a 5% yield with the peso. So I'm not the surprised to see Mexican peso at a nine year high. I see the speculators in the futures market have never been as long the Mexican peso as they are now. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. Mexican peso has been, has had a hell of a run and it's flying high and it, it may continue. The Goldman Sachs Commodity Index hit a two-year low in December, but has rallied about 12% since then. I know cocoa has gone ballistic, but are other commodities also rallying? You know, I should I should put a chart of cocoa up on my uh, on my uh, blog this week. The, the chart is absolutely astonishing. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, cocoa basically comes from a couple of countries, uh, you know, Ghana and, uh, and Ivory Coast, I guess, it, on, on the west coast of, of Africa. And they've got some supply issues there. I think some, some bug or virus or whatever come along and hurt the cocoa plants. But yeah, it's been spectacular. I don't trade cocoa. I just, you know, try to stick to some things I know something about. Uh, copper hit an 11 month high this week. It just kind of caught fire here the past couple of weeks. And I found that kind of interesting because, I mean, I, it, going back, I don't know, almost, almost 10 years, I remember people talking about copper. Copper is going to go to the moon. You know, we're going to have all this electrification and, and it takes forever to get copper out of the ground and they get these different countries around the world are agitating, uh, not allowing people to mine copper and, you know, it's just going to be in short supply. Well, I don't know that this is Finally, copper breaking out, and it's certainly not at all time highs, but yeah, you know, we, we've had a, a sharp rally in copper here uh, over the past three weeks or so. And uh, WTI crude oil, we touched, uh, traded through, I should say, $81 on uh, front month uh, WTI. This week, we were $68 at the lows back in December, so uh, that's a, a a, a new a new four month high, I should say, in WTI. So yeah, the commodity markets, uh, you know, bubbling along here, kind of unnoticed, as it were, with the uh, tremendous rallies in the stock market. 
in your weekly trading desk notes on victoradare.ca, you post lots of charts and comments on different markets. You write about the trades you've done and things that are on your radar. But I noticed you highly recommended a podcast last week between two veteran traders. Why did you do that? You're right. Um, I, I subscribe to different services and, you know, I, I, some services give you information about different things. Um, anyway, there's two guys. Peter Brandt is somebody that Peter and I both worked for the same company. Well, it's over 40 years ago. Uh, Conti Commodity was one of the, the biggest commodity brokerage firms uh, in the world at that time. And, uh, we've, we've stayed in touch, uh, uh and I subscribe to his service. And another guy that um, Jason Shapiro, uh, I also subscribe to his service, and it's it's a very uh, uh, good service on what we call a commitment of traders data, which is sort of tells you who owns what in the in the different commodity markets. I was alerting my readers to the upcoming podcast because these two people are both veteran traders with way over 20 years of trading experience, and they're both market wizards in that they were included in one of Jack Swagger's books. So these guys are like real successful commodity traders that have been at it for a long time, and to my mind, they are as different as chalk and cheese. <laughs> and I thought... I think the most interesting thing about this interview that was coming up would be how these two guys who are apparently so different from each other, but both have generated a lot of profits consistently over a lot of years. I speculated that probably the only thing they had in common was how uh, diligent they are and uh, and disciplined about managing risk. And Jimmy, I think I've said on your show a few times that uh, I don't make money from trading because I've got a great crystal ball. I I do not. And anybody that says they have is is uh, either delusional <laughs> or lying. Uh, I make money from managing risk. Well, I'll tell you what, I was not disappointed when I watched this interview. And for your listeners, uh, they can go to my website, victoradare.ca, and, and get last week's uh, trading desk notes. Last week was, well, that was the 9th of, of March, and I'll, I'll put a link up there again when I write to uh, get the blog posted later today here on the, the 16th of March. But I'll put a link to that uh, that website. It is, if you are, if your listeners, if you're a trader or you want to be a trader, this would be probably one of the best interviews but with two traders talking to each other that i have ever watched and i've I've seen a lot of them over the years so i posted a link to that because i I wanted people that are interested in trading markets to to not miss this it's just a a, a, and these guys are just flat out honest they're neither one of them is trying to solicit money from people you know or you know they're not trying to say hey buy my uh, my service you know they could care less about that uh they just really had a great time with each other and they kind of became fast friends they didn't they knew of each other but didn't know each other before this interview anyway not to go on and on and on, but it is it is just a fabulous interview between two really successful guys who are really telling the truth about what trading is all about, how tough it is, and how you know what you actually really need to do to succeed. And I I just I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to to trade in these markets. Victor, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Jim, uh, it. <laughs> It is always a pleasure. Uh, I, I know I maybe go on a bit and get a bit rambly, but uh, yeah, it, it was it was fun to uh, to have this uh, this session with you. Thank you, thank you. My guest has been Victor Adair. Check out his website, victoradare.ca. Coming up, John Kaiser next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated. 
trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is John Kaiser, publisher of Kaiser Watch on KaiserResearch.com. He's speaking to us from where, John? The East Bay of the San Francisco area. John, can you tell us about the Kaiser Research bottom fishing, and do you have a special offer for our listeners? Well, Kaiser Research Online is a research platform that covers all the uh, ASX and uh, and Canadian uh, listed uh, resource companies. It's got a powerful search engine. You can search uh, at corporate and project level. It's intended for people, do-it-yourselfers, who know what they're looking for and are basically renting, saving time, renting this as a tool. But I also have the bottom fish collection, which is I, as a super user, go through there and flag those companies that I think are interesting and that are at some sort of bottom because there's usually some missing piece. I figure out what it is, describe it, and then my my, my paying subscribers who don't want to do it yourself, they then watch this bottom fish collection uh, for when the missing piece drops in. Uh, we're in such a bad bear market that you don't even have to buy them while they're bottom fish. You wait until the uh, missing piece falls in. Often there's only uh, maybe a double, a double or triple off the bottom. And when it's much better to buy it then because your timing is now excellent, you don't have that opportunity cost of waiting forever for the missing piece to fall in. And when the move is substantial enough, I promote them to my annual favorites collection, of which there are only nine this year after a brutal year last year where the whole thing ended up down 40%. Uh, this year it's down 10% after a pretty bad start. And uh, I've been kind of uh, uh, you know despondent about where this sector is going. And I've changed uh, my subscription system so that uh, all subscriptions expire at the end of this year. Uh, it costs four fifty for a uh, new member and right to the end of the year and uh this is the special that i have because at the end of the year i'm switching to a 200 dollar a month model and i may be doing that even sooner because in the last few weeks i've figured out what's going to drive this market out of its eternal bear market and but all those who have a membership that expires at the end of this year via the 450 deal they will be grandfathered to renew at the old rate and uh, i'm actually now quite optimistic that we're going to have a major bull cycle for the resource sector that will include the juniors and i think uh, by 2025 people will have no problem paying 200 dollars a month on an auto renewal basis you were at PDAC in Toronto earlier this month. How busy was it, and what was the mood? Uh, PDAC reported that just under 27,000 delegates uh, showed up, picked up their passes, and uh, the floor was very, very busy. Uh, in, in, in prior years, uh, the, the exhibit the hall was separate from the trade show. You needed to have an all-access pass to get into the trade show. Uh, last year and this year, they have blended it together so that you can walk between the uh, government pavilion area where, where all the, the geological surveys have their, have their, their material and walk into the uh, uh, exhibit hall where all the juniors and majors have their booths and are, you know, present, presenting their stories. Now, it was busy and upbeat. Now, compared to last year, last year, the, the, uh, uh, energy transition topic, lithium, lithium, copper. This is what everybody was quite excited about last year. This year, lithium, because it got pounded so badly uh, uh, in, last year and all, also into this year, was not so much the topic that everybody was uh, talking about. But what was interesting was during PDAC, the gold price started on an uptrend. And that kind of, I think, injected a bit of a, a, a positive mood. But 
the whole industry is still very ill. I had a day pass because that only costs uh, $25, $25 a day. And, uh, and, and, and I'm a kind of like an investor. I'm a journalist investor. So I was going around actually talking to companies at a hundred on my list, managed to visit about 50 of them uh, before I had to leave after, after three days of pound, pound, pounding the floor. But there were very few people with exhibit day pass. And that would be the broker who like wants to pop by just for an afternoon or so, or retail investors. Almost everybody had an all X access pass uh, on, the, on their lanyard, which allows them to go to talks or do anything. And most of those people are not paying four or $500 for an all access pass. They are all employees of industry or government. So the PDAC, even though it was busy and all, that was really all the employees of this sector and the related government sectors uh, having this great big get together. So even though the mood was good and there was a lot of people there, we are still in a bear market where investment capital is shunning the uh, resource and exploration industry. We previously talked about lithium 2.0. The price of lithium looks like it might have put in a bottom. More and more gigafactories and even terafactories are being planned all over the world. Are these massive expansion plans enough to kick off lithium 2.0? Well, Jim, during the past few years, we have seen electric vehicle uh, sales grow substantially, particularly in, in China, where it's now 40% of the uh, transportation fleet. Uh, it's still less than 10% in, in places like the United States and Europe. But Tesla has been the leader in selling electric vehicles. But uh, as the uh, lithium price started to come come down, which was partly in response to the Australians ramping up production, uh, electric vehicles start sales starts to slow. And, and the reason is quite simple. The elites have been buying these electric vehicles because they have several ICE vehicles that can take care of all their other needs. But for the masses to adopt it, the electric vehicle needs to be uh, affordable. It needs to cost like $30,000 like, like a Camry. It needs to have a thousand kilometers of range on a 10 minute charge. You need to be able to go to any gas station, sit there for 10 minutes while it recharges, and then you don't have to go there for another thousand kilometers or, or 700, 700 miles. And of course, ICE cars don't go that far. But Toyota has talked about being able to deliver such a car by 2027, which will be an elite car. Uh, but by 2030, they may have figured out how to make an affordable car. So we have this strange disconnect between the potential that I don't think is going to kick in until 2030. Uh, we've got kind of an S-curve pattern, I think, in terms of, of, of vehicle sales growth. Uh, the, the growth rate is going to stall and it's going to tread sideways for a while. But if all this comes together so that the electric vehicle is something that people actually want, then sales will go exponential in the 2030s. And this is the big problem. The, the gigafactories, you know, the battery assembly uh, uh, plants, uh, they take a couple years to build. Uh, uh, you just get some state where they say, well, we'll give you all kinds of uh, uh, kickbacks if you build here and create local jobs. Uh, those are no problem, and those are being built. But what's not really being done is preparing the lithium supply that will be needed when electric vehicle sales go exponential. And some people say, well, it'll be a sodium battery or something like that, else like that. No, if solid state uh, lithium ion battery becomes reality, that will be the best battery. That's what's going to go into all these electric, electric vehicles. So right now, the uh, lithium juniors have gotten hammered. We're still seeing the uh, 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 Azure Minerals uh, buyout by SQM and uh, Gina Reinhardt's Hancock uh, going through at an implied $2.7 billion valuation. That won't be in production until 2030. Uh, the exploration juniors have sort of lost their, their retail audience that they had gathered in the last, attracted in the last couple of years, and they're in a bit of a lull. But this all has to pick up again. And I expect uh, 
uh, by the end of this year, when the lithium price has gone back to, say, $10 a pound, which is really kind of what you need to have a, a six to 10 times expansion of supply become reality by, by 2030, uh, then you'll start seeing uh, uh, people focusing again on the lithi- lithium juniors. But the, there is this uh, disconnect between all the goals and all the downstream preparation being done and the reality of finding deposits, doing the feasibility demonstration, getting them permitted and getting them built in a, what's now pretty much a six-year period, which uh, the, the, the authorities are going to have to do something about their permitting timelines to make this reality, because six years is shorter than it usually takes to take a, a, a exploration, a project from a target to a construction decision. Is likely Asia going to be the biggest market for electric vehicles? And how can the battery metal juniors position themselves to take advantage of the biggest markets? China right now, it's a, it's a electric vehicle deployment. Uh, it is going to continue to grow because China has an oil import vulnerability. All their electric vehicles are largely powered by uh, uh, coal electricity. Uh, They have a lot of nuclear power plants coming on stream that they've been working on for the past uh, 15 years. So that will replace replace coal and make it less dirty. And I think, uh, you know, Asia, they'll try to sell it in the other surrounding countries, which don't have the manufacturing infrastructure. Uh, China adopted an industrial policy of subsidizing all these different uh, startup cars. Now they've kind of pulled back on the subsidies and are letting a Darwinian uh, process uh, wipe out all the uh, the weaker ones and have the champions champions emerge, champions like BYD, which are now trying to sell their electric vehicles into the rest of the world, and they cost less. And this is a big problem for the rest of the world because Europe, the United States, they do not want their domestic car industries to uh, to die as a result of a flood of much cheaper electric vehicle imports. Uh, and, and of course, this is an anti-globalization principle. Uh, we do have this uh, uh, conflict between the global west and global east in the background with China and Russia allied as the leaders of the global east. That's still there as a potential disruptor of selling electric vehicles from Asia into into the global west nations. Uh, uh, but right now, it's... Uh, but these cars, they're good for, say, the ch- local you know, distances that the Chinese drill, uh, drive in their communities. But I, I, and they might be suitable for Europe. But for countries like Canada and the United States, uh, these electric vehicles, even though they're cheaper, still aren't good enough for what the uh, ordinary individual wants to have in an electric vehicle. Because when you get into like high-density housing, there's no place to plug these things in. Uh, the, the parkings are limited. Uh, you can park out on the street, but there's no charging there. And the gas stations don't have charging. And it still takes lots of hours to get these uh, cheaper cars uh, uh, recharged. So uh, I don't think, uh, uh, I think Asia will be the place where it grows initially. Uh, and the Europeans and the, and the Americans, they'll catch up later this decade when the, the EVs have evolved to the form that public is going to want with the price of gold moving higher are any of the gold juniors on your bottom fish list starting to wake up gold has been very unusual uh since february 28th there's only been a few down days it's at an all-time high now it retreated a bit uh, yesterday uh what's interesting about this move in gold is there's no clear explanation for it. You look at the, uh, the the GLD ETF, and it has lost 2 million ounces since the start of the year. And apparently, uh, since the start of last year, all the ETFs together have lost 20 million ounces. So that means retail investors are exiting the gold space. And even during this last run-up, uh, the, there has only been a couple days where there was a modest increase in the GLD holdings. So retail is not the source of this buying. Uh, this buying is coming from somewhere else, and you would think it maybe is these hedge funds and that expecting uh, uh, interest rates to go down. 
uh, which, uh, you know, the, the CPI came in at 3.2% uh, uh, this week, and which means that inflation is, is tracking sideways above what their target of, of 2%. Uh, so lower interest rates are not really on the horizon. The economy continues to be fairly strong. So I think we'll be stuck with higher interest rates, which should be with the current high interest rates for a while yet. And that should be bad for gold, yet gold is going up. And, and my own suspicion is that there's some big whales out there who have some sense of what's going to happen on the geopolitical uh, stage that could be very disruptive. Now, for a while there, there was a lot of talk about uh, Putin wanting to nuke, uh, do tactical nukes in Ukraine, and that's a line that uh, has not been crossed since uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed at the end of World War II. Uh, if such an event happens, it changes the world in a big way. Uh, Putin has tried to dial back this uh, nuclear threat while at the same time talking about how Russia has the capacity that if anything goes really wrong for them, they can like crush the world with their huge arsenal of nu nuclear bombs. So the situation is one where Suppose this line is crossed. What does the United States do in response? And there's two responses. Do a massive uh, conventional weapon retaliation, which has the risk that Putin uh, unleashes Armageddon, or just do nothing and basically do what the Republican Party appears to want, which is to hand Ukraine to, uh, to Russia and, and eventually have sort of a, a right-wing type of a uh, dictatorship uh, sweep over the rest of Europe and ultimately uh, become what America itself itself is all about. And if that ends up happening, the world changes in a big way because the U.S. dollar is not going to be this unifying currency that everybody uses. Then the world completely fragments and the United States starts to stand alone. And that would increase demand, real demand, for the price of gold. And the juniors, they haven't woken up yet. They're still slumbering. It's a great time for me because I've got all these gold gold uh, expiration and even the ounce in the ground juniors on my bottom fish list. The general uh, perception is the $2,000 floor is not definitively in tomorrow gold could get whacked a couple hundred bucks back below $2,000. So there's no conviction out there yet that things have changed, that $4,000 is the next level for gold, as opposed to back below $2,000. The price of silver is also moving higher. Do you have silver companies on your bottom fish list? Uh, silver has been inching up, and it likes to track the price of gold, but the silver market has its own dynamic. Uh, while gold, uh, the 6.5 billion ounces, largely sit in vaults somewhere or in safes uh, uh, waiting to be resold for, for, for money that you can use to buy other things, silver is out there fabricated to, into processes and things, doing stuff. In fact, there's even like a growing use for silver in, in solar, solar panels. Uh, um, so, and silver's also uh, primarily a byproduct of, of zinc mines, uh, of gold mines, of copper mines. So the the price of silver doesn't really determine uh, uh, the supply of silver. They just produce it as a byproduct and sell it for whatever the market the market can bear. So, but but silver with the increasing industrial demand, and, and we also have this crazy thing in Mexico where where Mexico is is contemplating a ban on open pit mining. It's also uh, created a new concession system that's being challenged in the courts, but it's still in place where uh, if anybody applies for a new concession, an expiration license in Mexico, um, well, you don't just get it for applying for it and paying whatever the fees are. No, it goes into a public tender so everybody can see why, what it is that you want and why and can put in a competing bid, which basically means nobody's going to uh, spend any any intellectual uh, geological work on generating prospects in Mexico. So Mexico is going to go probably flat as a source of additional silver producer, and it's the biggest silver producer in the world. So there's, there's a good case to focus on silver projects. And uh, yes, I have uh, several silver companies on the... Uh, on, on my bottom fish collection, uh, 
One of them is, is Silver North Resources, which I had at the Metals Investor Forum. And they are in the Yukon. They have the holding project to the west of the uh, Keno Hill District, which Alexco tried to operate, but could not make profitable because it had early, in the early days, sold the Silver Stream to Silver Wheaton, expecting that when they go deeper, the zinc grade would increase and the silver grade would diminish. It turned out that that was not the case. The silver grade persisted at depth and they could never make money. But Hecla bought out the silver wheat in the stream and bought out Alexco and is now reviving this camp. And the, the, the Haldane Mountain Project of Silver North, because of its geological nature of, uh, of, of being uh, more oxidized, uh, uh, it has not had the same degree of expiration. So there's an example of an expiration play that's starting to get legs. And again, this company's coming out of the gutter below 10 cents, uh, uh, has abandoned being a prospect generator, and is now going 100% into a silver play. And yes, silver is something to definitely uh, pay attention to because it could go up uh, whether or not gold goes up. Do you have copper companies on your bottom fish list? Oh, I have, I have lots of uh, copper companies uh, on the bottom fish list. Uh, copper has been stuck below $4 a pound for a while. Many of the new projects in jurisdictions uh, such as the United States, which are secure, require a $4 or better price for copper to be worth developing. But we're also starting to see interest in new exploration. And, and for example, uh, Hercules Silver, which uh, has a major copper discovery at what was supposed to be a silver zinc bed vein play, uh, there's now a staking rush going on with Rio Tinto and Barrick and others uh, doing old-fashioned post-staking in Idaho in an area covered by, by, by a basalt veneer that would have masked anything underneath. It's all based on a recognition that here's a trend in the United States that has potentially elevated copper grade deposits that are that have been blind and never been really available for exploration. And there's other parts of the United States that have that potential, and so does so does Canada. And and uh, uh, I've got the, you know I'm, I don't want to mention many companies, but for example, Faraday Copper in Arizona has a PEA out, which is you know at 375 copper is not good enough. But if we get copper into the 450 or better range, which it will have to do because the International Energy Agency predicts that the, by, uh, by uh, uh, 2030, uh, we, the world will need 50% more copper supply above and beyond what the general macro economy, economy needs just to meet the energy transition goals for, for 2030. And then there's, of course, the, the AI dream unfolding right now, and they're starting to realize, wow, AI consumes vast amounts of electricity, far more than the existing infrastructure can can provide. So we're going to see an infrastructure expansion boom because the AI dream, unlike the energy transition goals, which require people to make transitional sacrifices in order to maybe have the planet not be a a cinder by, by 20, 2050 in which the boomers who control all the money, you know, they won't live to find out whether the sacrifice was, was worth the, worth the effort. Uh, they're not very keen about any of this stuff. Uh, uh, but AI startups, all kinds of fantastic things can come out. N not just stealing jobs from, from the white collar knowledge workers. Uh, yes, that will happen, but there's all kinds of innovations that can come out of AI. And when this really gets cranking, they're going to need to expand the electricity infrastructure, the energy infrastructure, and they're going to need to get the metals. And if we have this global West and East conflict get hot so that the global East, which supplies the majority of the metals that the global West consumes, uh, we're going to see a boom emerging. Copper is going to be one of the key metals that, that everybody's going to say we have to find this in secure jurisdictions, and we have to develop them quickly. This hasn't happened yet. There is still this anti-mining, not-in-my-backyard attitude there. The permitting systems are still geared towards dragging out everything as long as possible. Uh, but there's a crisis coming this year. 
where every where the attitude's going to change, which is why I've gone from being despondent about the future of the resource juniors to being quite optimistic that this is going to turn out to be a fantastic year, even though certainly don't see it in terms of subscriptions or anything like that or in the trading in these juniors. But these changes are coming because they have to. Your thoughts on uranium and uranium juniors? During the past year, the uranium spot price uh, made it to over $100. It's retreated back into the $80 to $90 a pound range. Uh, we really need $80 a pound as a floor. Now, the reason uh, the uranium had such a sad decade was, uh, was, was twofold. One was the Fukushima accident in 2011, which shut down Japanese uh, nuclear energy production and prompted the Germans to foolishly shut down their nuclear energy so that they could expose themselves to the uh, machinations of Putin and his natural natural gas supply. And, and then, of course, there was Kazakhstan, which uh, came on stream as a producer during the 2000s and is now the dominant producer. Last year, it ran into some some difficulties uh, uh, meeting its production goal. Supposedly, uh, they, they ran short of sulfuric acid. Uh, I, I can't really imagine that this is the case, but I think they got tired uh, of selling their uh, uh, uranium cheaply because the long-term contracts uh, had run out and they were going to be stuck selling at cheap spot prices. So I suspect they have manipulated the situation to allow the price to go up so that they can write better priced long term contracts with the with the utilities but but that's that's uh just the short term story the bigger term story is that uh, even though the, there's a, like a entire movement in the united states to have fossil fuels forever uh the, the nuclear energy uh, crowd really likes nuclear energy as a source of clean energy and while in the United States it takes forever to get a power plant, a nuclear power plant uh, permitted and built, and then it costs way more than anybody ever predicted, there's these small modular reactors, uh, which everybody's looking at. China and Russia are, are pushing them a lot faster than, than the Europeans and the Americans. But these have potential to be smaller installations, especially feeding some of these um, these data centers, uh, these AI systems that are going to have enormous energy consumption. And, and then there's the problem that Kazakhstan is going to be feeding China's nuclear power plants, which are coming on stream in a much bigger way. That All the growth in nuclear uh, energy is happening, happening in China. And we can't, in the West, can't rely on Kazakhstan uranium supply. So this is why the, the, the uranium exploration juniors, uh, uh, the Athabasca Basin ones, uh, have woken up uh, uh, at, at, at $80, $90 a pound, uh, these uh, unconformity-associated uh, basement-hosted high-grade deposits. Uh, they're in the money. It's worth exploring for them. In the United States, uh, which uh, apparently doesn't think it can rely on Canada as a secure source of uh, uranium. There's now interest revived in these low-grade roll front uh, deposits. Uh, and there's also finally movement in getting back to enriching the U-308 into the form that's used by nuclear fuel, which is now dominated by Russia because in the name of globalization, yeah, let's have all these dirty things done in other countries while we have our nice clean backyard and, and make ourselves dependent on, on countries that in the last uh, decade have started to become our enemies rather than our friends. So yes, I have uranium juniors on my list and uh, one of them, Can Alaska, just got promoted to, uh, to, to the favorites collection thanks to what may be a world-class MacArthur scale discovery. Are diamonds a thing of the past? You know, diamond exploration was uh, a big thing from 1992 onwards when when Diamet discovered uh, the caddy field. But uh, the diamonds have a major problem, which is that, you know, when you find a kimberlite that's diamondiferous, it will cost you five million bucks minimum to find out what the grade is. But the grade doesn't tell you what the rock value is. You need to know what the average carat value is. And for that, you need to do expensive bulk sampling. So you got to spend at least another $10 million getting bulk samples 
large enough to uh, produce a parcel of diamonds that allows the value to be calculated. So you're out of pocket $15 million before you know, have any chance of knowing whether your discovery is in the money. And this is the reason that the diamond exploration has really faded as something the market is interested in. Give us a gold intersection or a copper intersection or uranium intersection in a geological context where you can see the size of the prize uh, growing to whatever whatever the limit's going to be. Uh, that's what the market wants. But diamond exploration... Um, it's not so much interested in anymore. And then there's been the emergence of lab-grown diamonds. Uh, De Beers has cleverly uh, gone into the same business of producing lab-grown diamonds, but selling them a lot cheaper than uh, uh, natural diamonds. And, and that's sort of heading off that threat. But there's also the idea that uh, you know people aren't that interested in diamonds anymore. And now we have the problem that Russia, uh, the biggest uh, producer by volume, uh, it's it's now everybody's enemy because it has uh, said Ukrainians uh, don't exist. They need to be annihilated. This is actually Russia. And by the way, Eastern Europe, uh, you're actually still part of us. And maybe Western Europe, uh, we need to have the Russian Empire be 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 everything uh, in, in in that sort of European continent. So diamonds have a bit of a stigma because a lot of them come from Russia and end up in the in the market. So yeah, I think diamond exploration will never have a boom period like it did 20, 30 years ago. How many companies are on your bottom fish list and how many of those are gold juniors? Oh, the, the, the list is at, at 100 and it's growing. Uh, I'm having so much fun going through my, my, my database, using the search engine, uh, checking out the story. Uh, they call me a bottom fisher, but I'm really a story hunter. I look for companies where they have real people. And again, the, the, the real companies... That there are only about 15% of the total. The rest are these useless lifestyle companies that have zero potential of finding anything. In fact, my whole bottom fish collection is like me corralling all the serious companies into one batch to distinguish them from all the uh, the pump and dump coattailers out there who have zero chance of actually finding finding anything significant. And and I think about maybe a third of the hundred so far. Have have a gold gold component. Uh, uh, should I call a copper gold play a, a gold company or, or a copper company? I've also got a fair number of, of lithium juniors in there. A bunch of prospect generators because I think uh, if we do get this uh, resurgence of the resource juniors uh, understood as the salvation warriors for this uh, you know AI startup dream that's going to be un unfolding. Uh, what I call sort of a pick and shovel type. Type, type scenario instead of like the go to the moon AI startup.com type of uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, these are the companies which are suddenly going to be, be back in business. But I've got rare earth companies in there. I've got all, all the metals covered in, in, in some form or other because I'm mainly interested in two things. One, if there's an existing deposit, if we get a higher real price increase from gold, like going to say 2,500, 3,000, it makes these ounce in the ground stocks suddenly very valuable. But then there's also the expiration stories. And, and I'm agnostic as to the metal. I don't care what the metal is, so long as whatever you come up with works at the metal price that we currently have. Have you ever thought about creating a bottom fish index to give people a better idea of what's going on with the junior miners? Because I'm constantly adding stocks to the bottom fish list and at the end of each year I, I sort of go through it and, and renew the ones that uh, haven't, uh, haven't disappointed me or, 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 or that, you know, that haven't taken off yet. It's difficult to have an index that's, that's meaningful. I use the uh, favorites collection. I create an index for that. And, and of course it was down. 20% uh, right off the dot at the start of this year. It's only down 10% now, but that's probably a better indicator of, uh, of, of what the trend is with the juniors. We are not out of the woods yet in terms of the resource juniors. Uh, at the Metals Investor Forum, I kicked off my talk saying that uh, the, the structural problems facing the sector are such that without a turnaround in the macro attitude towards the role that resource juniors play, the Canadian resource junior ecosystem will be dead by the end of this decade. So I'm looking at this as like the juniors, the serious groups, 
they know that uh, the, their 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 time is limited, and this is what's exciting because they they are all going all in, doing their absolute best. Because if they don't hit it out of the park, it's end of the entire league for them. So it's an exciting period for me right now. Is working capital currently a problem for a lot of the junior miners? Oh, is it ever. I, I track the working capital of the companies. Uh, every, every, with each, uh, every month I, I uh, update the uh, quarterly financials, the balance sheets and that uh, that have come due for, for, for that period. And of the 1,142 TSX venture companies that I've tagged as being in the resource sector, um, about 40, 50% of them owe $3.3 billion. They have negative working capital of that much. And the other group is a little bit better. They have positive working capital of about $3.7 billion. And it's interesting, uh, the $2.1 billion of the negative working capital sits in companies trading below 10 cents. So if you're, if you're too lazy to do uh, uh, all the research to track down uh, the financials and see what the shape of the company is, bottom fishing is a way to uh, end up making your capital disappear and disappear very, very quickly. Um, in, in terms of uh, where to look for, uh, there are about 470 companies, about 41%, have working capital of more than five hundred thousand dollars, and that's out of eleven hundred and forty-two. Forty-two percent have absolute negative, and another sixteen percent have you know between zero and five hundred thousand. Which the problem with that is the overhead costs of this sector are so high that the mandatory ones, like all the fees and accounting and compliance stuff that you need to do. These, these companies are just using their money to continue to exist, hoping that something will change that will flow money into the treasuries. And we are back into a financing winter. The uh, uh, first two months of this year, financing activity has been dismal. What there has been has been concentrated in a relatively small group of companies. The system is cash starved. The audience out there thinks you know, the, the, when I say the ecosystem's dying, it's because the audience isn't there giving money on a meaningful scale. Again, it's 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 a form of a, a disconnect. Uh, we have so much more metal that we're going to need, and it can't come from all these parts of the world like 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 China or, or Russia or, or or Congo. It's going to have to come from secure jurisdictions where the juniors have the capacity to operate and. It's, it's like no, nobody gets it. It's just not happening. But I think that could change overnight. But this time around, I think the market will be far more sophisticated. The money will flow into those serious bottom fish. We'll see a three to five times increase in their prices just off the bottom to get to a level where they're properly priced for their potential to make a discovery. And then you'll still have five to ten times upside potential if they do deliver a discovery that looks like it could eventually become a mine. What percentage of shares do you like to see insiders owning in junior mining companies? Well, insiders are defined as uh, parties that own 10% or more, and uh, directors of the company, uh, some employees, officers of the company, so um, when, when companies start getting into several hundred million shares, the, the percentage owned by the official insiders, the people working for the companies, as opposed to, say, say an institution or some large shareholder that happens to own 10% or more, for example, and Eric, Eric Sprott, uh, uh, the percentage can get quite low. Um, you know, I like to see at least 5% owned by the management uh, level insiders, uh, but I also look at the absolute amount. For example, if there's some company where the, you know, the CEO is refusing to roll the stock back and start fresh, and I see the CEO owns three, four million shares, and even though it's like a you know, five-cent stock or whatever, 
this person is motivated. And he might own only, you know, two or she might only own two percent of the company. I will make exceptions for where I see a personal stake by the people who make the decisions and care. I do not like companies where the board has like one significant uh, shareholder and everybody else has a token position or nothing. And I definitely loathe this new pestilence that has seeped into the Canadian system, which are remote con- broker controlled, remote controlled juniors, where the insiders own like 500,000 shares. They're all just puppets. And the brokers are all hidden. They're all below 10%, so they don't have to file. They have to paper in their offshore accounts. And you see these companies end up getting funded uh, uh, with a management team that really has no track record and no incentive to do anything. These poisons one needs to recognize and avoid like the plague. Do you think it's too easy for junior mining companies to be rolled back with the end result crushed shareholders? Well, one of the problems with uh, the Canadian stock exchanges is that the uh, shares, I think, believe trade in half-cent increments. Uh, In Australia, where they get up to billions of shares, uh, they trade in tenths of a penny. So you can have a stock going from 0.1 cent to 1 cent and go back and forth. So when stocks get really cheap in the dumpster, like like below 5 cents, uh, uh, the percentage swings are are substantial if you're buying, you know, at, at the min, at the minimum price at the, at the increments that that are allowed, and and so sometimes you have to do a rollback to get out of that gutter. But I am not a big fan of rollbacks uh, if the paper has been dispersed and nobody owns a meaningful amount. Um, then probably rollback is necessary and start over. But I've also seen one stock. Uh, Uh, and and I won't mention it because I haven't even added it back to the bottom fishing list. Uh, They ended up being brutalized by the sellers all the way down to a penny, but the insiders, they they stuck with the company. They switched from being a prospect generator to being a swing for the fences, 100% owned company, and they had a group of backers who have been buying all the cheap stock, putting, putting it away, and, and while they're all invisible, they are supportive of the management. So those you don't really want to see rolled back. Now, rollbacks are okay if the rollback is done in conjunction with a financing that's priced as part of the rollback. But if you have some two-cent stock and you do a 24 one rollback and it goes to 40 cents, well, you know it's going to sink right back to five, 10 cents, and then they'll do a cheap financing there and you obliterate all the minority shareholders. So um, in, in a sense, seeing these big rollbacks done, easily done, that's a warning sign. Like in, in my database, you can see which companies have gone through series and series of rollbacks. You just look at who the people are, and those people, they are ones that I know I will not touch these people. These are lifestyle people who crank through the cycles, come rent, rent the flavor of the month, pump the stock, blow the stock, roll it back and, and start over again. So uh, I kind of like the ease with which a rollbacks can be done because it paints the tape with a track record of management groups that you want to avoid. What's the latest on junior mining regulatory nightmares? Uh, the, uh, well, well, the one that really annoyed me was when uh, CDAR, the filing system, the, the regulators decided it worked too well so they fixed it by turning it into Cedar Click a Lot, so that it is unusable. You know, you, you have to click uh, almost 20 times to get any document. It's basically a system designed to discourage investors from researching companies. And I guess it works uh, if you go to Stockwatch. They have all the Cedar filings there, and you you can say say for five ten bucks a month get a basic account there where you can look up stock quotes and look up the news release or whatever. But you can get access to Cedar, so they they've kind of like privatized Cedar by making the the one that the companies all pay for uh, totally useless. So, and the other frustration that I have is they did something really positive a year and a half ago, which was the listed uh, issuer financing exemption, which finally got away 
got rid of the uh, millionaire requirement to participate in a private placement. Uh, this is now any ordinary person can participate in a private placement. And, and it's free trading uh, right away if it's done under the life exemption. But they've made the paperwork so onerous that only brokerage firms are able to do this. And the problem with this is that brokerage firms don't want retail investors as clients. They just want high net worth clients on whose, uh, whose assets they gather up and then sort of manage. And they're not really interested in the resource junior. So the brokerage sector, you know, the full service brokerage sector has been forced by rule changes to abandon the retail investor, but it's the only one that the regulations really allow to do these life exemptions. So it's really being just used to create instantly free trading paper for high net worth individuals. It's the life is not being used to breathe life into the mass of bottom fish juniors with real toiling geologist type people who need to raise $500,000 and would like to be able to take it from ordinary investors who don't qualify for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the accredited investor exemption. Is it getting tougher and tougher to get permits to drill and mine? This is another disconnect, and, and Canada is an absolute disgrace. When Justin Trudeau signed on to UNDRIP, the United Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, he failed to understand that Canada is claimed four times its land mass by the First Nations that are still, that are, that are in Canada. In fact, one group out of British Columbia has just published a manifesto which quotes the UNDRIP uh, 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 document and saying, we actually own everything, mineral rights included. We were here before you who were born here afterwards. Therefore, we have the veto rights over absolutely everything. And the, uh, the federal government and even some of the provincial governments have accommodated this uh, request by First Nations to actually control everything. And so in British Columbia, you have this decision where thanks to some new law that the NDP government adopted, uh, the existing claim system uh, is, is in violation of the requirements of this law. So, so now they're looking at changing it so that if you want to stake claims in British Columbia, uh, uh, you first have to consult all the First Nations, which means you have to disclose, formally disclose what you've applied for, and then you have to sit down with these competing parties, uh, overlapping, uh, overlapping groups. Each one of them thinks that they are the chief of the, uh, of, of the area that you staked. And of course, you're never going to get a consensus from them. So it will die. So what will happen is after you've done the work of uh, generating the idea and failing to get, get title to it because you can't uh, herd these cats into any sort of a agreement, these, these cats will then uh, herd themselves, stake the claim and, uh, consult themselves and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is okay with us. So there's this cynicism that's now part of the whole system, which is going to potentially kill exploration in Canada, and which is a shame because Canada has an extraordinary role to play in mobilizing new raw material supply for the global West insofar as it doesn't get subsumed into the uh, autocracies of the, uh, of, the global, of the global East. And again, this wake-up call needs to happen. The, the, the permitting problem is especially an issue for the juniors because they have their funding cycle. So they generate a bunch of targets, uh, they drill them, one of them comes up with a hit, and now they see it goes in this direction. Uh, now they have to go apply for a permit for this. And this becomes this huge time-wasting thing. And a lot of times the First Nations couldn't care less. You, 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 can, you can beg them to sit down and consult, find out what it is that you want, but, uh, but they don't care. They're busy doing whatever else it is that they're doing. So you end up being stonewalled and can't move forward. And this, this is perhaps a reason why the audiences for the Canadian juniors has evaporated. You just can't follow up a good news with a you know, fast track exploration program to drill more because you have to go into the uh, consultation permitting penalty box. And for, you know, advanced projects, uh, they, you know, you know they, they should continue to do it properly, but they should do it quickly. You know, don't, don't cut corners, but don't drag everything out. Canada has made it, made the permitting process a bureaucratic industry 
And, and maybe we'll, AI will replace all these useless bureaucrats and get stuff done, done really quickly. Maybe that's one positive uh, benefit from AI, getting rid of these fake knowledge workers whose only job is to sustain their incomes while dragging out their job of making sure that if a mine is developed, it's done properly with everything assessed in a time, timely manner. So yes, big problem. United States, you also have these huge NIMBY organizations, NGOs, uh, their lifestyle. Uh, they have the Donate Now button. They track down any mining or exploration property project and turn it into a fundraising opportunity and, and then spend all their time interfering with the actual government level level permitting processes just so that they can sustain their lifestyles pretending to be protectors of an environment while actually endorsing the brutal practices that go on in, in global east countries where downstream victims have no say about the emissions that get dumped on them which create the cheaper cost structure that allows metals to flood flood the, um, the rest of the world and make mines where the responsible mining is the law uh, impossible to compete. So it's a big problem. If metal prices go higher due to a reduction in mining and only some mining jurisdictions are still mining, is location, location, location more important than ever? You know, the, the, the big thing with the late 90s into the 2000s and even into part of the 2010s was the opening of third world frontiers, you know, Latin America, Africa, parts of Asia to, to exploration and development. And, and the 2000s when the China super cycle kicked in and, and increased the uh, demand for raw materials by an order of magnitude, we had substantial real price increases in metals, which had been in a long-term decline in real, in real price, price terms. And that was a boom time for the exploration juniors. But, but Africa, uh, not only are most of the governments there klept, kleptocrats, uh, China and Russia have their mitts into an increasing part of Africa. So even though you hear all this talk about colonization, yeah, China and Russia are recolonizing Africa, making all these African nations part of their raw material supply needs. And South America has its own trend towards nationalism, and it has also its various indigenous groups, which the Western NGOs, uh, as part of their fundraising strategy, they find them and they stir them up to oppose, uh, you know, exploration and development in, in their backyard. So South America is becoming, lots of it's becoming difficult for the exploration juniors. And, and of course, Mexico, I've already mentioned, uh, Mexico wants to become a non-mining state. Uh, it wants to become a satellite manufacturing place for China so that China can bypass the tariffs of shipping uh, stuff manufactured in China into the United, into the United States. Uh, so I think jurisdictions like Scandinavia, uh, Canada, the United States, this is where we need to look for new deposits. And it's going to be harder because everything's been picked over that sticking out of the ground. You're going to look at some tiny little thing sticking out of the ground. And you're going to have to do exploration to see, is this the tip of an iceberg, a tentacle of an octopus? It's got, and this is why the, 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 the quality of the management groups of these juniors is so important. Uh, these lifestyle clowns have no idea what to do. But the serious groups... They're now embracing all these AI computational methods. They're gathering reams of data. They're drilling geological holes just to understand the geology in the third dimension so they can see what the uh, geochemical zonation is. They can start mapping what the geophysics is saying to the rocks that are encountered there. And, and they're using like uh, computational methods to vector in on targets, but also to figure out, is there a prize with size possible within this geological context. This is a new level of sophistication that's coming. And we, we see it happening at the like really big level, like, like Bill Gates has backed uh, cobalt, which has just made claims it has made a discovery in Zambia, uh, on, you know, on the Zambian side of the uh, African copper belt, of a Kamoa Kakula scale copper discovery, also blind, but using these techniques of gathering information and homing in 
on targets uh, and then making the discovery. And the juniors are capable of doing this. And I mentioned Hercules Silver as an example where they started off with this useless silver silver uh, uh, target that had 400 holes into it, but never quite you know, had the grade and tonnage to be worth developing. But it's the tip of a giant porphyry system that's multi, multi-phased that could end up becoming a major underground copper mine with the grades required for this. So this, this, this is uh, East Jurisdictions. This is where I want my juniors. And if you look at my, uh, my, 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 my Google Earth map that, uh, that shows where all the projects are from my bottom fish, uh, you know, most of them are in Canada and the United States because I'm quite leery of these other jurisdictions where the juniors are having a decreasing shot of getting title or keeping title to anything and getting anything done. Are there any new young mining promoters that you're watching? Yes, yes, there, there, are, there are a number of groups, and I don't want to mention them because these are part of my uh, bottom fish fish collection, and, and I want to steer my, my paying subscribers to them. Uh, but one of them was a, uh, a, a favorite from last year, and that's Kenorland, which is Zach Flood's company. And there's an example of a group of, of young people who are completely immersed in the computational aspect of exploration. And, and this company is interesting because it doesn't just restake former claims where somebody like uh, drilled a hole or two and got a you know, 10-inch vein and sort of gave up and, and left it there. No, they're doing grassroots data gathering and coming up with large land positions in areas that haven't seen a lot of exploration, but they're putting a lot of geological theory and some very basic information that they're gathering. Say, this region, this trend has potential for this type of deposit. And and Kenorland stands out because uh, it's been successful in attracting majors as as exploration partners. And the majors are looking for a prize with size, and they have the in-house capacity to understand the geological concept that the company has uh, assembled. And, and they're willing to, like, you know, do rich deals rather than, than crappy little deals. Unlike uh, some prospect generators, they farm their projects out to other juniors, which are generally lifestyle-type companies who are really just renting the property so that they can beat the drums and blow off their paper or to whatever suckers that they can pull in with this fantasy that maybe there will be something here. So, yeah, there, there's, there's a number of groups, and, uh, and, and several of them I talked to in, uh, in, 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 in Toronto and, and also in Vancouver. And, and this is what's exciting because uh, it's these new groups which are coming in, and they're in their 30s and 40s, which are replacing the uh, older generation. I'm sort of at the tail end of the, well, of these, this retiring group of people. And yes, this, this is starting to happen. It's not enough, but it is starting to happen. What do junior mining companies have to do to get your attention? Well, I often get these emails or calls uh, saying, uh, what do we have to do to get you to recommend us? And usually that's an invitation to explain what is the sort of payment that I require to like the company. Well, that's not my business model. Uh, what, the, uh, what works for me, if somebody wants to introduce their, their story uh, and get me to follow them, is to uh, basically anticipate the question that I would ask them uh, about their projects. What are you trying to to accomplish with this project, and what are you doing differently from what everybody else has done before you that gives you a shot at being successful where they have failed, and what do you need to do to make this happen? And, and of course, I'm always looking for some sort of hook. You know, there's a bunch of geology and stuff there. Is there some reason that maybe when this time around exploration dollars go into the project, a big success can work. So that's, again, I mentioned earlier, they call me a bottom fisher, but I'm really a story hunter. Give me a story that uh, is interesting, that I can translate for my audience. But 
The other thing that companies are horrible at, and to some degree the regulations restrict them, is quantifying the size of the prize. What are you trying to find it? What would it be worth at the end of the day if you are successful? What would it look like? It is depressing how absent the whole concept of economic geology is within the uh, exploration industry. Anybody who is a CEO of a company or, or should, should know how to do economic geology, know how to do an outcome visualization like I do, like I recently did with Can Alaska. I said, well, well what if you have a, a MacArthur River clone? Well, what would that be worth today? And sort of do, figure out all the costs on that, do the discounted cash flow model. And, and this is an important thing with regard to the resource juniors. The resource juniors, no matter what they find, in the case of Can Alaska, MacArthur would be worth eight billion Canadian at that sort of eighty eighty nine dollars a pound a pound uranium. That's the upside limit. It's never going to be a trillion dollar Amazon. All these AI startups, uh, uh, any one of them could become could become the, the 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 winner, which takes all, which becomes fabulously rich. The resource juniors cannot compete in that arena. That they're going to go up maybe five, ten, maybe twenty times, sometimes. Sometimes a hundred times in the case of an extremely unusual, a big, big, big discovery. And that's what's hurt the juniors and the inability of management to really show what the upside limit is and be able to admit, yeah, what we're looking for is a $500 million prize. It's, it's, it's not a $5 billion prize. And, and yeah, based on fully diluted and that, that means, uh, that would be worth maybe, uh, you know, Two bucks a share, five bucks a share, whatever, based on, based on how many fully diluted. This is what's missing from this sector. So when I talk to these people, I want them to explain kind of what the size of the prize is and then why and how this prize is plausible. And a Trump question. Who do you think will be better for mining in the U.S., Trump or Biden and why? Well, you know, you know the, I, I'm, I'm what you call a, uh, a critical thinker who occupies the upper half of the uh, belief horseshoe, whereas true believers, uh, they're all in the bottom half of the uh, belief horseshoe and believe they know the truth and all that and, and think uh, this is the way things are going to be and we're going to f- use coercion to force everybody else to follow our beliefs. And I think right now we're facing a sort of competition between democracy, which occupies the upper half of the belief horseshoe, and autocracy, which is the bottom half of the belief horseshoe. And the general fear amongst those who are are, 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 are for democracy is that if Trump becomes president, he will then turn this into some sort of autocracy and and, uh, maybe even a theocratic autocracy. But I think that if he is elected, he will probably tell all the fundamentalists to go fly a kite. He will tell all the Tea Party deficit hawks to go fly a kite. He's going to look at this AI dream. And during his first term, he wanted to do infrastructure renewal. But the Republican Party, which still controlled itself at the time, wanted none of that because that would increase the national debt. And no Republican president has ever failed to increase the national debt by a greater amount than any predecessor. And Biden right now holds a record. And I think if Trump is in charge, he's going to say, you know, I do want to make America great again. It's infrastructure sucks. It's, it's like it was largely built in the 20s and 30s and hasn't really been renewed. We got this fantastic AI dream coming, coming on stream uh, uh, that can have fast track innovations that change the world in a very big way. I think we're going to increase the national debt and make this happen. And, and of course, uh, the boomers are going to say, well, we might be okay with that. But then the younger generations, they're going to say, well, if you're going to saddle us with all this debt that you won't live long enough to, to, to have to deal with, uh, we want you to embrace the energy transition goals and make your infrastructure renewal geared towards net zero emissions by 2050, just in case it makes a difference. And, and once America gets out of this polarized funk, uh, it could 
forget all this this nastiness and start looking at the global East and China and Russia and all the crap that they're enforcing on their people and say, yeah, we're actually going to be a great nation. We're going to stop fussing about all this other stuff and we are going to goose our economy and we're going to look at the uh, permitting and stuff that uh, seems to be just uh, you know parasitic on stuff being mined elsewhere. We're going to streamline it. We're going to make it efficient. We're not going to pollute our own backyard, but we're going to make things happen. So uh, Trump if he does this, could actually be better for the resource juniors and the resource sector in general than Biden. Uh, if Biden is elected, there is still this problem that the NIMBY crowd has a grip on the Democratic Party and does seems unwilling to recognize that there is an existential crisis uh, flooding the, uh, the global West nations thanks to their embrace of globalization and becoming parasites on the costs that are dumped in other jurisdictions so that they can have everything cheap. And I don't know if the Biden administration will change to embrace this new reality, but this may happen even before the end of this year, so so who knows? So I'm kind of agnostic on who will end up being better for the resource sector. John, can you tell us about your special offer again and how people can subscribe? Again, if you believe I may be right that this decade-long bear market for the resource juniors is going to come to an end in a positive way as opposed to just disappearing entirely, that in fact resource juniors are going to be seen as the heroes that uh, deliver the picks and shovels that will make the AI dream reality. Uh, take that 450, get a membership, get the 450, be grandfather to continue to do that. Because if I am right, uh, the service that I provide, I'm not going to want the thousands and thousands of subscribers that can afford 450. I'm going to limit it to the ones who took the shot while it was still extreme uncertainty. And then the rest... They can afford the $200 a month to be part of the uh, Kaiser Research Online Club. John, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. <laughs> thank you, Jim. You're welcome. My guest has been John Kaiser, publisher of Kaiser Watch on kaiserresearch.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Victor Adair, and John Kaiser. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from Recyclico marketing manager, Tony Mitchell. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for Recyclico. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Hey, it's glad to be back, Jim. Last time we talked, Recyclico was looking for a new CEO. What's the story there now? Well, uh, Jim, we just uh, had put out a press release today um, that uh, you know we're pleased to announce that uh, Richard Chodowski has been appointed as interim CEO. And, um, you know, Richard's been on the board of directors for the company since uh, November 1st of last year and has now stepped up to fill the CEO position. Um, Richard's a lawyer and consultant based in New York with over four decades of experience in, you know, things such as complex transactions and investment banking. So he's previously been on the acting CEO of Volteri uh, Corporation, a NASDAQ-listed company, a partner of SNR Denton and Rubenbaum LLP, and worked as an investment banker with uh, CIBC World Markets. So we're glad to have him in the driver's seat uh, at this stage in the company's growth. And um, I'm also happy to report that uh, Kurt Langeshoot will be back 
um, on our board of directors. Uh, Kurt is also based in New York and is uh, principal and portfolio manager of uh, Broadbill Investment Partners, LLC, which he co-founded in 2011. Um, he's previously served on Recycle Co.'s board from 2012 to 2021 and has been on our advisory board since that time. So I'm sure our listeners will be glad to know Kurt has experience in the energy and technology industries and has significant public and private capital markets expertise. So overall, it's, you know, it's exciting to have someone with Richard's deep experience at the helm, backed up by Kurt's longstanding guidance and advisory support back on our board. And, um, you know, these appointments are intended to strengthen uh, our leadership and financial expertise as, you know, we move from being an early stage venture company to a major player in the battery recycling industry and continue our search for a permanent CEO. Speaking of the battery recycling industry, how are things in the commodities markets going in regards to battery materials? You know, that's a great question, Jim. You know, here in the office and um, EV industry in general, uh, one of the key indicators everyone follows is the price of lithium carbonate. You know, it serves because it serves a, you know, a, a general bellwether or yardstick for the state of the industry as a whole. And, um, you know, when you look back on the uh, prices and whatnot, back at its peak in November 2022, when it was trading, you know, around at approximately 37,000 U.S. dollars per um, metric ton, its price, you know, supported the business plans of a wide range of competitors in our space, you know. Since then, with the price dropping from that all-time high to a low in January of this year to approximately around 13,000 U.S. dollars per metric ton, it's put a lot of pressure for profitability on everyone in the EV industry, from the miner to the end battery producer. But most importantly, uh, during the downturn, as we were uh, regularly updating our operational costs, because they're constantly fluctuating, the fluctuating commodity prices as well, in our spreadsheets, our process and business plan continue to be quite profitable. Um, because let's face it, Jim, you know, when you're in discussions with major battery recyclers and producers, it all boils down to whether your solution can sustainably turn a profit on their balance sheet, especially in the lean times. So that said, um, you know, I'll include a link to a chart on lithium carbonate below this podcast. So, which will further, you know, help our listeners to be a bit more educated in how they can follow the industry. So what's next for RecycleCo? Well, Jim, these are just a couple of the positive notes, uh, you know, that I've mentioned here now that I wanted to pass along to our listeners at the moment. And while I'd love to give more detail on other things we have brewing, I think it's best if I leave those for a future podcast as we uh, continue to firm things up, uh, which are pretty exciting stuff. You know, from the day I took on this role, uh, my goal has been to simplify communications on our highly complex battery recycling process, you know, to a level anyone could understand from those interested in investing in our revolutionary technology to the C-suite exec, you know, looking to recoup their significant production losses. So while we've been largely successful in reaching these diverse groups, I, I know there's always room for improvement. At least that's how I look at things always. And especially as RecycleCo and our position within the battery industry evolves and expands from being an early stage venture company to a battery industry pioneer and major player in the battery recycling industry with the multiple joint ventures around the globe. And all that said, with the appointment of Richard and Kurt, the ongoing confirmation of the profitability of our process and our bright future direction, I'm personally excited by all the possibilities these new developments open up. And I'm looking forward to providing our loyal investors and potential joint venture partners with the info and technology they've been looking for as we move forward. Where are you traded and where can people get more information? Well, um, we're traded on the TSX Venture, uh, TSXV, under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB, under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, (laughs) under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can get more information on our website at RecycleCo.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. No problem, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on March 14th. 
Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.